Hi, my name is Marty Bolivar. I work for Nordic Semiconductor for one more week, and I'm here to tell you about system device tree support in Zephyr. So right now I want to give you a quick overview of what we're going to talk about. The first thing that I'll mention is that the work is currently paused uh, since I'm transitioning jobs, but it will be picked up back again. So this is not just stale work, but I do want to let you know that just right up front. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, uh, recap how device tree fits into Zephyr, and more importantly, talk about why the way that we're using device tree in Zephyr is not scaling anymore to meet the needs of today's hardware, really, and tomorrow's hardware, quite certainly. Then we'll talk a little bit about uh, an evolving specification called system device tree that we think can help solve the problem that we've run into with device tree in Zephyr and in other places. Talk a little bit about the contributions that have been completed already to add system device tree support to Zephyr and outline the next steps. So Nordic will continue this work, but the details are TBD. At the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you a reference to a GitHub issue, which is sort of the umbrella covering all of the work that's ongoing in upstream Zephyr to meet the needs of the heterogeneous SOCs that we're increasingly seeing. Uh, and so I will encourage you to follow that if this is uh, something that you're interested in. So about myself, I co-maintain the device tree subsystem in Zephyr. Uh, and I've been working on system device tree support for a while, and I have contributed a bit to the system device tree specification itself. To recap device tree, okay, so if you're here, right, you know, you're at the Zephyr Developers Conference, I'm assuming that you've used Zephyr, and if you use Zephyr, for better or worse, it's a little bit inescapable at this point, you've used device tree. Uh, but here's a quick recap just in case. So this is a picture from uh, our documentation about the configuration phase that happens in CMake, right? And, you know, that's way too small for you to read, but this is all device tree. So not only does device tree sort of happen very early in the build, it then goes on to influence just about everything else that happens in the build, right? It is where all the SOC hardware is described, where its boot time configuration lives. It's, you know, including the things like the system clock, very core kernel objects. It influences which drivers are selected by default in the device model. Uh, then within each driver, it decides basically which devices get instantiated. And it will handle a variety of application-specific hardware description and configuration, if that is what you choose, uh, and, and quite a lot more. So this is sort of a central abstraction, and it's done a lot of work for us. It's continuing to do a lot of work for us, but it has hit a scalability limit. Let's talk about that. So multi-core AMP, and by AMP, I mean asymmetric multiprocessing, where we've got a variety of different cores in a single SOC, maybe with different architectures. Maybe some of them are in an SMP configuration, but they have to talk to something else over there, over shared memory with you know, some inner processor interrupts. Uh, this is not as well supported, kind of in general in Zephyr, uh, as we would like. Uh, and in terms of sort of the many, one of the dominant architectures, uh, multi-core ARM V8M SOCs with trust and support were sort of the last straw uh, in terms of w w our ability to work around it within the bounds of the existing device tree specification in particular, but you know, sort of generally in the Zephyr hardware model in, in general. So uh, why? What are some examples? So memory addressing is a pain because in device tree, uh, a node that represents a hardware peripheral has a single address, but in ARM V8M, the peripheral addresses will vary by the security state of the SOC. So there's no way to write a single data structure that actually captures all of the addressing. Uh, we have, therefore, a big problem, especially when there are multiple cores on the SOC, because then you've got some static memory allocations, which happen in device tree, that have to be duplicated across all of the different builds that you're doing for any core that is involved in your system that has to talk to the other cores that are in your system. So this is obviously very cumbersome. It's very error prone. It has stopped scaling. Uh, the IPC resources are kind of a pain, right? Because if you want to, if you want to allocate, you know, this SPI peripheral over here to this core, and that UART over there to that core, or that UART over there to TFM, but this UART over here to your main application, that you know, that's a yet another big configuration layer that you're not really able to do in terms of having a single data structure that can encompass uh, everything that you need to define for the whole system. And of course, this is only going to get worse, right? The general industry trend is that we're incorporating more and more cores in just bigger and bigger AMP systems in a single SOC. So if we don't rise to meet this challenge, then it's going to be a continuing uh, problem for us as maintainers and kind of more importantly for anybody that is using Zephyr. So this is why we have been looking for 
new technologies that can try to address this problem. And I want to tell you about one in particular called System Device Tree that uh, pertains to how we think we can do this at the device tree layer. A little bit about System Device Tree. So it is a backwards compatible extension to the device tree specification. So device tree is a standard language. It has a specification. Uh, and System Device Tree is a separate specification that is a backwards compatible extension to it. It, like the regular device tree specification, is developed in the open. In a very nice set of circumstances, the people who develop the system device tree specification are in constant and regular contact with the people who develop and maintain the standard device tree specification. And of course, the people who develop and maintain the standard device tree specification also happen to be the people that maintain device tree within Linux. So the fact that this is sort of an existing standard that uh, is hosted by the device tree organization with a lot of cross-pollination between all of the people that we rely on to keep device tree alive and well was very interesting. And if you download the uh, slides for this talk, you'll get to see that the uh, specification itself is hosted on GitHub and you'll be able to read more about it there. So I'm not gonna obviously read the whole spec to you, but I do wanna uh, talk a little bit about some of the areas in particular that system device tree seems like a great fit for solving the problems that I outlined earlier. To do this, we're gonna have like a little uh, vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, compare and contrast table. So on the left, we'll have a standard device tree feature. And then on the right, there will be the name of the system device tree feature that sort of addresses a problem with the standard device tree feature. Let's start with cores. So in standard device tree, we have a node, slash CPUs. And slash CPUs has, well, okay, all the CPUs that should be relevant to the system. Uh, and it's assumed that the software that's running on the client program that is in consuming the device tree has access to everything in the device tree and that all of the cores that are relevant are under slash CPUs. Uh, well, that just doesn't scale to the AMP world, right? Because different cores are gonna see different things in terms of what their memory map is, what they have access to, et cetera, et cetera. So in system device tree, there's a concept called a CPU cluster. And CPU clusters, you can basically think of this as a generalization of slash CPUs. So slash CPUs is uh, basically kind of a, a degenerate case, if you like, of a CPU cluster. And you can have multiple CPU clusters within your system device tree, but they're all independent, uh, and they can each individually contain cores of arbitrary architectures. So I can have one CPU cluster over here with a RISC-V core, and another CPU cluster over here with an ARM core, and they don't necessarily share any other resources, but we can fit them in a single data structure. So uh, that allows us to kind of model the processors in an AMP SOC uh, in a nice way without having to do all of the kind of mm, workarounds that we have in Zephyr with, with like lots of you know, pound includes that, that branch out from which board you're using. Next up, let's talk about peripherals. So if you've looked at a standard device tree, you've probably seen this slash SOC node that tends to contain all of the peripherals on the SOC, right? Uh, all your spies, all your UARTs, what have you. Now, you may have noticed actually that slash SOC has a compatible. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not magic. The compatible is magic. Uh, the compatible for slash SOC is simple bus. Uh, and as you know, the compatible for a device tree property sort of says what it represents. And simple bus is actually a very special compatible because it has a meaning that is defined in the device tree specification. And that meaning is uh, anything inside of here is visible to the CPUs. Uh, with uh, trivial address mapping by default, and you know you can configure that with some other stuff, right? So the problem with that is, of course, now we have a bunch of different cores, and they don't all see the same peripherals. So what can we do? So in System Device Tree, they have a concept called an indirect bus, and in exactly the same way that you could view a CPU cluster as a strict generalization of slash CPUs, you can kind of view indirect bus as a generalization of a sim of a simple bus. So anything under the indirect bus still has a way to translate addresses from the contents of the simple bus or of the indirect bus node to the root address space or the address space of the root node. Uh, so you know you can you can know what the addresses are of the things inside of the indirect bus, but you do not have any assumption that anything can see those things. They are sort of invisible by default. And that's useful because we can map them in to CPU clusters. Uh, via some properties, right? So you can say, here are, you know, here's my RISC-V cluster, here's my ARM cluster, here are some indirect buses. This ARM core can see these two, 
but not that one. This RISC V core can see these two, and maybe they both can see this one, but these ones are independent. Uh, so that is extremely useful because it allows us to explicitly the model the hardware that is uh, particular to a CPU cluster, but also shared between CPU clusters. Again, within a single data structure without having all these sort of pound include workarounds that we have relied on up until now. Next, let's talk about this notion of the client program, which I kind of briefly mentioned earlier. Um, if you read the standard device tree specification, it, it'll talk about a client program. And this is just the thing that consumes the device tree, right? And the is important, right? Because there is one thing that is assumed to consume the standard device tree. And of course, uh, that's not really a valid assumption anymore in an AMP world because you have a bunch of different firmware images that are executing at various execution levels, maybe uh, in lockstep on one, SO on one core, or you know, maybe it's a bootloader that hands off control, or maybe these are things that are concurrently executing. Uh, and since there's no model for that, you run into a lot of problems like I was alluding to earlier in terms of defining, you know, even where you, your images get linked if there's a shared flash, right? You have to sort of duplicate this information, uh, and it's a hassle. And so what System Device Tree provides as a feature is this uh, concept called an execution domain. Uh, and so an execution domain sort of explicitly models the different firmware images, the software images. It could be a hypervisor or whatever uh, that are executing on your SOC. Now, that's great because you can, strict, you can restrict execution domains to just run on a subset of the CPUs within a CPU cluster. So you can define as many domains as you want, and then you can say each of them runs on this cluster, but not only on this cluster, but just on these CPUs within that cluster. So that's useful if, for example, you want to partition an SMP uh, cluster into, you know, this core is running Zephyr and these cores are running Linux. Finally, you can also explicitly restrict the peripherals, which should be accessible to the ex execution domain, right? Uh, earlier, we had an example where you know, we want TFM to have this UART and the application to have this other UART. So it's not just the case that if we have a CPU cluster, which in, you know, principle can view this indirect bus, that we necessarily want the execution domains that are running on the CPUs within that cluster to have access to all of the peripherals within the indirect bus. So the concept of an execution domain allows you to also explicitly say, you run on these CPUs in the CPU cluster and you see these things, but not anything else. Uh, so that's, that's lovely because it, again, gives us a sort of single data structure to define um, our peripheral access, our hardware map, and um, also what you know, SRAM, RAM, and Flash each execution domain runs on and has access to. So the last thing that I want to talk about is this notion of how many data structures are there. Uh, so it is really nice that a standard device tree is a single data structure. And like I mentioned earlier, a standard device tree is super useful. In Zephyr, we have built a lot on it, right? It served us well for many years. Those of you who were here at Anasys talk, you know, device tree was introduced several years ago and it's, it's scaled quite a bit and it works really well and we don't want to break that. So another sort of useful feature of system device tree is that you do have a single data structure, the system device tree, but you may be wondering, okay, how am I going to access the data in the system device tree? Am I going to have to rewrite all of my boot code that looks at the device tree or rewrite all the crazy macrobatics that you have in your driver to you know, instantiate your devices? And the answer is no, because the system device tree uh, specification authors um, sort of designed it specifically so that this individual data structure can be post-processed into separate standard device trees and then you get to reuse the existing client programs that you already have put together without any changes. It kind of looks like this, right? So you've got a single system device tree, and then you sort of restrict the view of the world to what's available in a single execution domain, which, like I talked about, then gives you a view of the world that is restricted to a particular CPU cluster, is restricted to particular CPUs within the CPU cluster that the domain should run on, and memory and peripherals and all that good stuff. And then you get a standard device tree that looks at exactly what you want that domain to be able to look at. So it's a lot less error prone, but you also have a single point of truth on the left. Sounds great. All right. Uh, how? What are we going to do? And the answer is sysbuild. So there's a link to the docs if you want to download the slides. You can look at it if you haven't already. But uh, sysbuild is already in upstream Zephyr, and it's 
been part of our work upstream to see how we can try to address this increasingly heterogeneous world. So SysBuild is our meta build thing, right? Any, any project that gets big enough has a meta build thing that builds all the real things. Uh, and SysBuild is ours if you haven't used it. So it's sort of a, a, a meta build system. It sits on top of other build systems. So SysBuild sits on top and then it spawns additional build systems that are regular Zephyr build systems or whatever arbitrary build system you want. It's not restricted to Zephyr images. Uh, now, in the case that SysBuild is spawning a Zephyr build system, that build system will have its own device tree. And so this becomes a natural point to integrate system device tree within Zephyr. And this is kind of the architecture that we've been moving towards. So we want, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of show on the top left, there's a system device tree for the SOC where we will define CPU clusters and buses, right? Uh, then there's a board system device tree underneath there, which can define board specific hardware, but also perhaps a default set of execution domains, things like that, that are specific to your product, for example. Uh, and then that gets fed along with some system device tree overlays into this new tooling that we've been prototyping and out you get on the right in purple, the individual Zephyr build systems with their individual device trees. So I don't have time to get into all the details, but here is a, a way you can download the slides and sort of look at what we envision going where in each of these files. Let's talk about contributions. I'll start with the specification. Uh, you have a specification link earlier in the slides. One of the first things that we did was convert it to the Sphinx format. So that's the same format that is used by the standard device tree spec. And it allowed us to move from a collection of markdown files to a single document that reads like the device tree spec. And it doesn't just, you know, it's not just also a PDF, right? Uh, another thing that we did is we uh, reworked the style and content of the system DT spec to match the device tree spec. So if you're used to reading the standard device tree specification and you know how to look at a standard binding uh, up there, you'll see the tables in exactly the same format. So it should be very familiar to you now uh, and you should be able to work with it uh, in the exact same way. We've also added a variety of examples. Uh, we've fleshed out all the tables of properties. Uh, and at this point, I want to thank Stefano uh, Stavolini and Bruce Ashfield from AMD Xilinx, who are the sort of core maintainers of this uh, for all the reviews and clarifications uh, as we've gone along. So at this point, uh, that's kind of where we are in spec land, where it's something that we think uh, other people can look at and read, and it should read in a familiar way. And in terms of the implementation, we've been working on this RFC. This is closed now. Uh, like I said, since uh, I'm moving on to another opportunity, but uh, we do have a system device tree demo where we have implemented our own sort of system device tree tooling within Zephyr and gotten it booting on different cores in various uh, AMP systems. What we have in the RFC is, is sort of a Kimu board because that's easy to evaluate, but uh, internally at Nordic, we've also ported this to a variety of our own uh, AMP SOCs. This was done without SysBuild integration because we weren't quite ready to do the SysBuild integration, but it's taught us a lot about how we can proceed further. Uh, and it also actually revealed a few issues within the system DT spec that we think need to be cleared up before we're going to merge something like this into the mainline Zephyr. That's where we are. Uh, I'll talk about next steps now. So the next steps are the first thing is we're going to cut system DT spec version 0 0.9 with what we have now. Right now you have to build the spec yourself and you know so there's a bit of release infrastructure that has to be built out uh, in order to make a spec. And then we have to sort of finalize the specification. Uh, there are uh, some issues in the same repository where the spec is hosted. So it's all on GitHub. There's a variety of GitHub issues. Uh, that are, have been filed against the spec. And once those are closed, then we can call it 1.0 and it'll be ready to go. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that there was a sort of umbrella issue that this is all part of. So if you're interested in following the effort further, you can download the slides and this uh, issue better support for multi-core AMP SOCs. Uh, it captures a, a wide ranging set of changes that we're working on upstream. So this isn't just device tree. Uh, we're also looking at reorganizing the main K config tree so that it's friendlier to use within SysBuild. Uh, we're looking at changing the way that we model boards so that uh, it's better captures the fact that we have these increasingly heterogeneous systems. And if you load this, you'll get links to a variety of sub issues that capture the sort of day-to-day -day development. 
you can follow those issues, you can subscribe to them for more updates, and if you're kind of interested in getting involved, uh, I would encourage you to ask in the Build System channel on the Zephyr Discord. So this is a short talk. I try to keep my talks short so that there's time for conference questions. Uh, please go ahead if you have one. Yeah. So the question was, uh, if I'm someone who wants to adopt SysBuild and I have a target that has cores with different architectures, is that supported? And the short answer is yes, because SysBuild is responsible for spawning separate Zephyr build system. So each of those gets its own selection of toolchain, et cetera, so that um, you, can tar you can sort of do whatever you want. We've learned a lot, actually. This is, this is work that many people at Nordic have been working on for a variety of years. And our first attempt tried to do everything within the main Zephyr build system. But you run into limitations within CMake itself that there is only one toolchain. And so that's one of the main reasons that SysBuild sort of has to exist, is so that you can spawn these sub-build systems. But thank you. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Is there so the question is is there any link between system device tree and boards with multiple SOCs? Yeah, so this is uh, uh, also a very interesting question. Uh, my short answer is that the system in system device tree is the same system in SOC. So no. Uh, we that's kind of why uh, as I mentioned earlier there's an umbrella issue which also covers some changes to the board model. And the generalizations that we have to do to the board model transcend the generalizations that we have to do to device tree. Because uh, those of you who have sort of struggled with this type of hardware already will know that Zephyr's board model, like when we call something a board, it's really just like an individual target within the board. And within, you know, now that we've got these sort of complicated SOCs and maybe a single PCB with multiple complicated SOCs, uh, the board model itself has hit scalability limits. So that's kind of interrelated but separate work. Other, yeah. Do I know if Trusted Firmware or Opti is looking into using Device Tree? I don't. I'm sorry. I, I'm not active in that community. Does Linux have the same scalability issues with this? So, yeah, I'm not a kernel maintainer, so this is me speaking outside of the bounds of my expertise, but my understanding is yes, uh, and that's one of the reasons why the system DT maintainers got involved. Uh, so at AMD Xilinx, my understanding is that they're, they're doing a lot of work, uh, you know, with like Zen running or puppeteering a little bit of Linux, and they uh, want to be able to have something that can sort of work in both domains. Okay, uh, so the, uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, but you're asking like uh, what the the purpose of having like a Linux development environment. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to talk about line endings. That's not that's not really, that's not relevant to my talk. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's okay. I I I I have my own opinions, and I I won't tell them to you so that the people who disagree with me won't yell at me after I'm done talking. Uh, <laughs> any other questions? Thank you.
Okay. Great, thanks. Uh, so let me let me repeat that. So for the people who are virtual and, and in the recording, so the spec is up on openamp.readthedocs.org right now. The system DT spec is uh, openamp. Uh, sorry, openamp.readthedocs.io. Correction. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so the, there was a webinar in December which has more information on using this with uh, Zen and Linux uh, within the OpenAMP community, so not, not the Zephyr community. Yes, sir. How does this build relate to something like Yocto? Yeah, so, which also orchestrates build systems. Yeah, so I, I said that uh, every project that gets big enough has its own meta build thing, and SysBuild is ours. Uh, you know, Yocto is another one. So I, I sort of see them as they are doing similar things in different domains. I don't know that I would want to run SysBuild under Yocto, for example. That wouldn't necessarily make sense to me. I remember a talk from a couple of ZDSs ago, or maybe it was another conference, where people were spawning the regular Zephyr build system under Yocto uh, as part of, you know, a recipe that filled out a larger system. Okay, uh, I think I can probably answer this, although, it's, yeah, it's also not exactly system device tree, um, but is SysBuild capable of signing images in multiple different ways? Uh, short answer, I think, is that it ultimately has to be. I don't know that it uh, can now, but I do think that we sort of have to solve the problem of uh, user pluggable stitching scripts uh, if we're going to make this work. Any other questions about system device tree in particular? Uh, if you're, I'm, you know, I, I'm happy to, you'll see me at the, at the, around the conference. My name is Marty Bolivar. If you recognize me, you can come ask me about line endings or anything else you want. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is if I have a device tree overlay that has to be applied to multiple samples, or I can generalize maybe a little bit to say multiple applications, multiple Zephyr applications, how do I do this? Uh, and I think that, yeah, that one way, uh, I think, in the future is that if you can express it as a system device tree overlay, then it goes into your whole system device tree. And from there, it goes into the right places in all of your regular device trees. So we don't have SysBuild today. Uh, sorry, we have SysBuild, but we don't have system device tree today. So what I will say is now we have snippets. That was a feature that was added for version 3.4. And so you can uh, look at the snippets documentation upstream, and that's a way to put a, a device tree overlay in. You can do more things with snippets, but one of the things you can do with snippets is put a device tree overlay in one place and then ask for it in multiple places. OK, uh, how are we doing on time, Keith? You're muted? Yeah, we've still got about uh, 12 minutes. 12 minutes, OK, great. Great, Q&A. So normally in hardware, when you talk about bridges between buses, so if you have one single bus and another single bus, you get a bridge. Is there, like, is there a standard mode that you can refer to, or is there a snippet the only kind of thing? So the question is if we, so at the hardware level, we have bridges between buses, right? Do we have something like that uh, in system device tree, do you mean? Um, I, I, that's a good question. I feel like I feel like device tree is such a uh, simplification of the hardware bus structure in general, right? Like we put everything under slash SSC regardless of how many layers of, of buses we really have. So, um, so one thing that I haven't really looked into, and maybe we should talk to Bruce after this talk, is uh, uh, I think Stefano's here. Actually, Bruce is not here. Um, is uh, there is a concept called a bus firewall, and so maybe that's something within System DT that could help. Bruce is here as well. Bruce is here as well. Okay. In the back. Yeah.
Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, if I've got like a ARM Cortex A running Linux, and I've got an ARM Cortex M running Zephyr, uh, and I want to put the hardware description for both of those in a single, for example, system device tree, can I do that? And the big obstacle to that today is, as the um, the person who asked the question alluded to, is that we don't really share bindings with Linux. So Zephyr has its own device tree bindings, which are sort of our schemas for what goes in the nodes. And since Linux and Zephyr have separate device tree bindings, often there uh, is no way to write a single device tree that'll work on both Zephyr and Linux. And that's, um, I guess, sort of speaking with my device tree maintainer hat on, that's not really for any good technical reason. That's really for historical reasons. Uh, and it's a known issue. And one of the things that we would like to do in the long term is uh, move the Zephyr bindings over to DT schema so that we, not only do we have our own bindings, we have our own bindings language. Uh, so we have a bigger tooling problem to solve before we could use the same bindings. We would actually have to be able to even use the same bindings language that Linux is using. Uh, and that's, that's a big lift. I've talked about it a bit with Kumar, who's my co-maintainer. Um, I think everyone wants that. Uh, and a lot, and help would be welcome because I'm not sure the I, I'm not sure actually that we're going to have the resources to to do it ourselves. Go ahead, Briggs. So could we, in system device tree, have sort of potentially separate indirect bus nodes, one which contains the nodes in the Zephyr bindings and another which contains the nodes in the Linux bindings, and then the regular uh, split into standard device trees would solve the problem? Um, sort of. The one way that that would not work is if we had the same compatible, but a uh, different binding, for example. Uh, back with, the, with your hat on. Yeah, so as a policy, the question is, as a policy decision, we want to do things in Zephyr with device tree that Linux doesn't do. So uh, one of the ways that we do things that Linux doesn't do is we might have a property that begins with Zephyr comma that will then contain some software configuration. Uh, since device tree is one of the main configuration planes for Zephyr and we don't have a user space telling us what to do uh, in the same way that you do in Linux, you know, Zephyr's user space is very different. Uh, you know, that's not something that is done in Linux, right? Uh, and so we want the ability to sort of have our own bindings in order to continue to do that, which we've decided that we want to do. Uh, and is that going to be a major obstacle? I think probably yes. I don't know that it is insurmountable, but I do agree that it's an issue. And we're going to, you know, we would need some way to uh, sort of keep the Zephyr changes on top, and then but a compatible subset that would be enough to be used uh, for nodes that are in common between an A and an M, for example. Yes. Is there some support for dynamically modifying the system device tree, for example, to migrate something between cores? Is that the question? Um, yeah, so in Zephyr, we are actually not going to use this uh, because our build system infrastructure is really sort of not set up to, to use this. But um, the system device tree specification, if you looked at the link, it was actually under a repository called Lopper. It was, you know, github.com slash device tree org slash Lopper. Uh, and the reason why is that Lopper is the standard tool for manipulating system device trees. It's uh, a Python application that is uh, designed to be a data-driven way to do anything you want, make arbitrary transformations to a system device tree. So uh, if the rewriting can be done uh, in some sort of user space that can run Python, then yes. Uh, and then otherwise, you might have to make your own tooling. But the 
the design of the specification itself does not preclude that, and there is an implementation of a tool that does exactly that as a proof of concept that that can be done. The question is, how does this transition play out in the long term? If I have an existing standard device tree that represents uh, my system, am I going to be able to continue to use it? Uh, in the, the short term, the answer is yes. And in the long term, if I have my way, the answer is yes. Uh, but that's, a, that's kind of a policy decision that has to be handled at the project level, right? We, are, we know we need a new model for boards. Right, And so that's going to be introduced alongside the existing model for boards because we don't want to break anybody, especially out of true users. Uh, then in the long term, I think that boards will probably be transitioned to the new board model once uh, it exists. Uh, and so the question has come up, do we want every device tree to be a system device tree or do we, you know, do we want to drag everybody into system device tree or do we want to have a world where only the AMP SOCs whose vendors want to support it can buy into system device tree and everybody else who wants to use it the existing way can continue to do so. Uh, there is some disagreement among the upstream maintainers about what the best course of action is. And my, my vote is let's continue to support both, but uh, I don't make the decisions, right? It's a, it's a big community. Uh, and I would definitely encourage you if you have a perspective as a user, we really, we really value that. And, you know, e examples and use cases really do help drive decisions. So if, if, you know, you don't feel like you can contribute technically, you know, contributing as a user with what you need uh, is a form of technical contribution and it's incredibly valuable. So please chime in. Any other questions? Awesome. Great questions. <laughs> Chris, you know me, you're my friend. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, the original device tree spec was a little emptier in order. Like, I'm pretty sure the device was sort of a lot bigger. Correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. System device tree via mixed endedness. Can we have mixed endedness in a system device tree? So I guess that means, like, within the property value, you would want a mixed endian? Ah, uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, within Zephyr, the answer is that it doesn't matter. I get well. No, it does matter because it doesn't. It does sort of matter. Yeah, because um, you put a 64-bit integer in two cells. Um, no, that's not. As far as I know, that's not contemplated. And we just sort of because it's meant to be backwards compatible. Yeah, I guess the big would have to manually spot. Yeah, you have to do it in exactly the same way as you do today. Okay. Okay. I think I'm going to call it there. Again, everybody's welcome to talk to me. Um, appreciate your time.